everybody to the Iowa Files. This is a topic which was suggested by one of our longtime fans. I thought, what could be interesting about buttons? I was so wrong. These things are amazing. So uh, the Iowa Files is brought to you thanks to the West Des Moines Public Library, our members and donors. There's a donation box down there, hint, hint. Um, uh, EMC Insurance Foundation and the Iowa Arts Council all make the programs and the streaming possible. So Karen Leibold has been into buttons for a very long time. And her journey started with a ginormous pickle jar full of buttons that her mom got at an auction. My great aunt Glenn's estate auction. And has ended up with her just receiving her 25 year ribbon from the National Button Group. So she knows her stuff. So, with very little further ado, I would like to introduce Karen Leibold. Thank you. It's great to be here and motivation to put together this program. We will start with Iowa buttons. Um, all buttons are just simply fascinating. Fasten, fastener. <sighs> I'm gonna, I teased you with that. I'm gonna hold. All right. Um, antique and vintage clothing buttons are beautiful and historic. Everything you can imagine is reflected in a button. <clears throat> Iowa is famous for the one and a half billion Mississippi River clamshell buttons produced in the early 1900s. The buttons were simple and utilitarian. Their cards, which were on the previous slide, are very fun to collect with their graphics. And this card of buttons is about as fancy as uh, Iowa buttons ever were. They're simple, utilitarian, made from clamshells. <clears throat> any collectors in the group? Are any of you collectors of anything? <laughs> and everything. All right, this hobby's for you. These images reflect the types of things that have attracted many people over the years. <clears throat> Textiles, the 60s, uh, carousel horse, mid-century mod, Danish uh, uh, teapot, depression glass, railroad ania. I will point out that uh, that's Clive. My husband is a model railroader, and he put this together, modeling Clive in the 1920s. Swanson House is right there, and that's Clive's historical uh, museum. <clears throat> uh, you can view it through the, one of the windows, so you can stop over any, any time. Uh, Ephemera. Pleased to meet you. <laughs> Rebus is military and guns. How do you connect guns to buttons, you ask? <clears throat> Colt Manufacturing Company. <clears throat> They invented their own version of Bakelite when, um, when they needed a less expensive material for the, than the pearl gun handles, which was what was on, the, and they diversified, making buttons. You can't, could never buy Colt buttons. They were the maker and distributor to lots of other uh, button button groups. Where am I? Oh, the mid-mod. 
You know, there's that needlework and the fun colors of the of the 60s. This is a US military locket button. Uh, you could soldiers or their family could buy those for them and they could they could wear them on their uniforms. A uh, railroad uniform button, Chicago, Milwaukee, St. Paul, and Pacific. That's the one who goes that goes through Clive. Used to go through Clive. And a rebus. Time flies. My how time flies. And then the V button, the victory button, uh, World War II home front. It's painted and buffed celluloid. V for victory. What's the Morse code for V? Dot, 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 dash. Da, 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 da. Every topic imaginable. The study of buttons is so interesting because of the intersection of histories. History of manufacturing, society. This is a suffragette's button. Suffragette, one of the suffragette colors. There were multiple suffragette groups that used different colors. The Beatles. See the beat? Oh, it's a beetle with music. The Beatles. Uh, she, she, seashells. Uh -uh. That's a molded glass. The sea creatures are painted on the back. Mythology. All kinds of, of mythology and stories. This is Merchant of Loves, or Loves for Sale. The, um, the notion of capturing or purchasing love through Cupid sellers was popular in ancient Rome literature. <clears throat> um, commemorating history, there's Queen Elizabeth II. And I said, every topic imaginable. Every topic. Yes, even risque topics. L.A. Sade or something like that. French, for she has agreed, or she gave in, or some version of that, presumably to marriage. Uh, so trends and issues of the times are reflected through buttons, including political. George Washington inaugural button, see the uh, 13 colonies? That's a large button. <clears throat> The early rubber button, I don't remember if it's backmarked Goodyear, but Goodyear um, vulcanized, the, the, developed the vulcanizing process, and we got buttons out of that. Uh, dueling frogs, it, it's something derogatory about the Frenchman. And then Teddy Roosevelt. A button actually saved the music. Here's a quick account. Um, Handel's fellow performer, uh, his last name was Matheson, <clears throat> this account is the most enduring. He recalls that it could all have ended in tragedy, a duel they were had, had God's guidance not graciously ordained that my blade thrusting against my opponent's broad metal coat button should be shattered. We would not have all that wonderful music if it weren't for that button. Oh, and another reason, another thing buttons, they're just gorgeous. These are all fairly large. Um, this one is shell with a, a brass adornment and maybe turquoise, probably glass. And this one is ceramic with a sterling silver overlay 
and there's some symbolism there. The rose for lo love, the forget-me-nots for forget-me-not, and I don't remember what, what the other one was. This one is enamel. It has little foil payones. Butcher my French. <laughs> um, lovely old button. Um, late late 18th century, early 19th century. And my favorite button um, is also an enamel button, hand painted and with a silver overlay. Just gorgeous. <clears throat> That's one of, my, one of my criteria for buttons is I have to like it. The other criteria is if it makes me smile or laugh. <clears throat> These are underwear. Yeah, there's a pioneer utilitarian button. Um, a little more about that. And this is a, a gal in Iowa makes those. Big leather button. She paints the eye and everything. Okay, a bit of a rest from eye candy. <clears throat> Poet John Keats was right. A thing of beauty is a joy forever. To the uninitiated, buttons are merely indispensable fasteners. But as one studies them, buttons begin to reflect the social, artistic, and economic history of their time and place, and um, of their manufacture and use. The study of buttons also focuses on what they were made of. <clears throat> Buttons have been produced from almost every known natural and man-made material. The materials used are, a, are an indicator of how old the button is. As technology and, and chemistry progress through the, through the ages, the, it's fun to see that the buttons, they tried to imitate the natural materials. Um, cotton. Obviously for cotton fabric, but also the cellulose, <clears throat> which is important. Oh, and hoof and horn. And this is a tagua nut, vegetable ivory, and tortoise shell, and a little friend. All those natural materials are transformed through history. <clears throat> Two examples, the cotton, not only is spun into thread for the fabric, um, it's a major source of cellulose, which is the major ingredient in celluloid film. Same thing with rubber. Um, the vulcanization process introduced tires and buttons. That would have been in the 1860s. A brief history of fasteners. Ancient times, bone or stick stuck through the holes of an animal skin. We don't really have documentation back then. Roman Empire, <clears throat> pins and fibulae, which are a brooch, we're used to secure the flowing garments and are more truly jewelry than they are when they were buttons. This one is gold. Those would be much simpler in design. The ones they find are always corroded to, to find one in good shape. The buttonhole had not been invented yet. So the first time we really see buttons is not until the 16th century. Oh, we get to keep going. Um, it's the 16th century that buttons were sewn <clears throat> or tied to the garments, and most were decorative rather than functional. <clears throat> Uh, 
Have you heard of the field of cloth of gold in 1520? I had not. It was, it was when Francis I and Henry VIII met for the first time. $20 million was spent for this two-week celebration of these two heads of the country getting together. <clears throat> Francis I wore a coat with 13,600 gold buttons. They weren't fasteners, they were just decoration, but they were in the form of a button. <clears throat> At this event, this is a, a painting that they think um, Henry commissioned. <clears throat> imagine, I can't imagine this, 12,000 royals, nobles, attendants, and servants gathered in the fields on the northern tip of modern-day France between English-held Eunice and French-held Andres, where they enjoyed nights of revelry in enormous temporary palaces of brick, timber, canvas, and glass. The things you learn, buttoning. <clears throat> the 18th century was the golden age of buttons. Uh, generally, they're jeweler made and large, and in the beginning, worn by men, showing things off. This is a detail whoop, of a costume belonging to Axel von Fersen, worn at the court of Versailles, probably made in Paris about 1685. The theme of the world upside down, I'm sorry, known as Le Monde Renverse in France, appeared in European prints as early as the 16th century. The English term topsy-turvy, <clears throat> meaning a disordered state of affairs, also dates from this time. And mythology, <clears throat> Athena at rest from war. Note her helmet dangling on the tree. Uh, Athena's, Athena or um, Minerva, depending upon whether you're Greek or Roman, <clears throat> one of the key identifiers is her helmet. So her helmet is in here. We can verify that it's Athena. <clears throat> Another interesting 18th century phenomenon. This is the character of the young blade, Beau Brummel. Blinded by the light of these flashy buttons. Excess of the uh, times. I won't sing for you. Blinded by the light. The 18th century uh, courtiers Taste for buttons is what spurred the height of handcrafted button art. The industrial age. Parts and more parts. Buttons are no longer handmade. They're hand assembled and maybe some of the parts are handmade. <clears throat> it's interesting to track patents of each of these uh, developments in button manufacture. Early 19th century, a perfume button. <clears throat> Back to that. The button sizes I want to mention are not great big ones anymore. They're more like an inch is pretty standard. So that's one way to date a button. <clears throat> Women had joined in the visual display of social status, which is exactly what it was. <clears throat> the, I'm not going to say that here. 
the perfume button has um, cotton or it could be an asbestos fiber stuffed in there to hold the um, to hold the scent. <clears throat> Early 1800s. How was this? How did the world smell? <laughs> Walking down the street of London. Yeah. So fumes. There is another type of button developed at the end of the century and used clear into the 20s. <clears throat> they're usually much smaller. They're, they're easy to find. They have velvet background and then some sort of a design. <clears throat> Legend has it, and they are called perfume buttons by most everybody who knows about it, but we've never been able to verify that, in fact, women used these buttons for that purpose. <clears throat> um, I have found some that were disintegrated, and if you put perfume on that velvet, yeah, over time it would disintegrate, but generally they wear pretty well. So, but if you hear people talk about perfume buttons, that very likely is um, the type of button they're talking about. <clears throat> Mid 19th century, the steamboat Arabia sank near Kansas City. Have any of you been there? A few. It's interesting, literally a snapshot of 1856. <clears throat> the wooden cases of calico fabric and calico china buttons went down with her. <clears throat> oh, here's a little tidbit I learned. Um, working folks and pioneers were making shirts and dresses from calico cotton fabrics, and matching calico buttons were given away with fabric purchases. I didn't know they were given away. 19th century, a little later, Victorian era, a fashionable calling gown of the 19th century could have as many as 75 little buttons on it. Some fastening, a lot for decoration. <clears throat> um, many types of buttons, but black glass in particular because of Queen Victoria wearing black for the rest of her life. And the world follows what the queen does, so there are many, many, many black buttons. Queen Victoria's were carved jet, which is a mineral, uh, petrified bogwood, something like that. <clears throat> but black glass is what everybody else wore, because. Uh, Jet buttons were expensive, even then. Some cards that the buttons are on to sell even say jet buttons. So jet is the name of a color, and it's just the name of black glass. <clears throat> now on to the 20th century. Early 20th century, before World War II, one. <clears throat> this button very much reflects Archibald Knox, who was a prolific designer for Liberty and Country Company in England. That's another genre of buttons that are fun to collect. Uh, this one's a uh, stamped metal in a machine and enamel. And it's brass. It doesn't show up real well in that picture, but. Ha! Huh. After the war, getting into the 20s, <clears throat> uniform buttons. These are from overalls. Mona is an average, my friend Mona. 
uh, who is also a collector, uh, is an avid fan of these overall buttons. And this is a page from the National Button Society's book of information that focuses only on these overall buttons. <clears throat> Where's, oh, I'm sorry. Let's see, I am looking for, oh, the white elephant. That I cut it off, but the white elephant trademark made up of picture and word was registered to Vogel Brothers, New York City in June 1983. At the time, it covered men's and boys' outer clothing. It's kind of like advertising through buttons. Now the 20th century, 30s, 40s. <clears throat> during even, even during the Great Depression, fashion kept happening. <clears throat> Fabric was rationed, including in the U.S. for a short time, so garments were cut in, a, in an economy of fabric. My mom grew up sewing in this era and passed the skill of laying out garments in the most efficient way using the least amount of, of fabric. And she also passed on the concept of improving your garment by putting nice, replacing the store buttons with something nicer. <clears throat> Eliza Schiaparelli. Are those buttons crazy or what? <laughs> Look up Eliza Schaap or Elsa, excuse me, I keep saying it. it's Eliza Minnelli. <laughs> Elsa Schiaparelli. Uh, outlandish was, was her, her thing. Those buttons are fun to collect, but very difficult to find. And the Amelia Earhart, how on our earth does that fit into the button story? Amelia is said to be the first celebrity to develop a fashion line. Elsa Schiaparelli provided advice and the Amelia Earhart fashion line debuted at Macy's late 1933. The venture did not take off due to the escalating tensions that led up to World War II. <clears throat> okay, after World War II, it's time for fun. Put the wartime chemistry advances to use. Trafari jewelry designer, Alfred Philippe, <clears throat> um, designed these animal buttons. Originally they had rock crystal bellies in them and were um, sterling silver plated in gold. Gold <coughs> vermeil I think is what it's called. <clears throat> when the metals became too expensive they switched to using acrylic cabochons and then by the 1950s everybody was making these and they were made of pop metal and, and different, different synthetic polymers. Uh, Philippe sued Coro for duplicating his, his designs. At, by the time the court took up the case, most jewelry makers <clears throat> had jelly belly but items, so the judge dropped the case. Goofy is what early button collectors called these realistic buttons, goofies. More fun. The bling on dressy occasion of the 50s and, and 60s some. Um, the focus of fashion was moving toward the fabric rather than the buttons. 
So by the 60s, the focus, there's the fabric, and the buttons are much simpler. Lots and lots of cloth buttons. Uh, nylon was the big deal. Easy care. A lot of solid color and color blocking also, the, the mid-mod mid -mod style. I'm going to leave that where it is and mention a few other things. Uh, studio buttons. Buttons made by artists in their studio. In, with button collectors, that's kind of a fun, fun thing to collect. <clears throat> so you may see some of those out here. Um, Yeah, and I was going to close with, many people have a tin or a jar of old buttons. If they were your grandmothers, or better, your great-grandmothers, or great-aunt Glenn's in my case, <coughs> there could be some that really tell a story. Let's do questions. Yeah. These are all my buttons. From, from uh, that pickle jar? No! <laughs> uh, the pickle jar had a lot of this kind of button. Oh, oh, and the pickle jar had a carved seal. Wall, a seal. Walrus ivory button. So there were some very nice buttons in the jar. Lots, Lots of the uh, utilitarian 1930s celluloid buttons. Um, what else did I, I mention that. This button, if you're interested in collecting, is a good place to start. It's affordable. Uh, prices are way outdated. I think there's prices in this one. Maybe not. But the information hasn't changed. It's expanded, but it hasn't changed. This, on the other extreme, is a calendar from 2006. And we were calculating doing the every seven years yeah. of a perpetual calendar that it, it won't be good until 2024, four, something like that. But I definitely keep it because Every page has an incredible, mostly 18th century button <clears throat> and information about it. This book was written, this uh, calendar and a couple books were written by Gary Brockman, who was a uh, writer. I can't, my brain's not clicking, for uh, one of the encyclopedia countries. Master, wordsmith, knowledge is beyond. It's really fun to, to hear um, button history from him, and that's what, that's what this is. <clears throat> Other questions? Um, there's a button society in the Yes. What happens to get that one? Thank you for the segue. <laughs> we hold a button show every year, except for COVID. Um, the Iowa Button Society show is June 8th, 9th, 10th in Ames. So pick up a flyer. There's information on, on the back. The program is Friday night, and it's going to focus on shoe buttons. The woman who's presenting its family were involved in shoe buttons, making shoe buttons. And we'll even have a couple of the, the tools they use to fasten the shoe buttons to, to old shoes. And they'll also be, along with shoe buttons, the sh button hooks. Ah, there's some amazing ones out there. I have one that I love that's agate. Banded agate. <clears throat>
Be sure to pick one up. Open, open, best time to come would probably be during open showroom times on Friday from one o'clock to I think five o'clock is when it's open. And then the program is usually at seven. And then, um, yeah, it's a fun way to, to meet people that have this crazy affliction of collecting pretty little things <laughs> and things that make you laugh. <clears throat> Yeah. How do you go about getting started collecting buttons? Where do you find the buttons? And are there some that are obviously more valuable than others? And Very much so. Where do I find the buttons? How do I know which ones are the good ones? Most of the buttons, the really nice buttons, are in the hands of collectors. The uh, button collecting hobby started wartime. 30s as a way to make money. People who had nice buttons, because everybody saved buttons to be reused, were um, sold those buttons for some income. And so most of the old stashes have been have come out, and now they the buttons circulate amongst collectors. So button auctions, internet, uh, button shows are ways to find buttons. In the, in the antique world, you do occasionally find some. And that, if you like the thrill of the hunt, literally, and the, and the thrill of a find in a, in a jar of buttons, uh, that happens. <clears throat> Not as often as I'd like anymore. <laughs> Uh, how to get started, leave your name, and we're going to do another, another session focusing on people that are, that are interested in learning more about collecting buttons. Yeah? I have a question. On that table over there, there's a, one of your friends has um, buttons that are cloth covered, but it, like, one has what looks like a cubby sauce on it, and different ones with a ship, and each one's a, a particular picture. Were those, um, was that done to match the garment probably? Like if you're gonna reindeer a garment, you do- Is this the one you're, you're thinking of? Yes, and so they were doing like the little ship outfit or no. how did no. this come to be? Ties. What is it? Men's ties. Oh, so they just made them into a button then? Yeah, oh, really? yeah, oh. and people have been doing that forever. Just, um, just for the sake of collecting. Yeah. The exactly. Wow. Exactly. That's what the National Button Society is all about, is you know, not just collecting them because they're pretty, but, but preserving them. Sometimes really nice buttons get put in jewelry, and essentially their historical value is destroyed. So education is a big part of the National Button Society. So people don't cut, go cutting the shanks off the buttons. <clears throat> um, yeah, you've been able to see them. So this one, these are all Bakelite. Or the Catlin is the, another brand of the same kind of composite. <clears throat> when you come up and take a look, this is by Edith Weber. She had a line of jewelry, brooches, so any jewelry collectors in here might recognize that name. And uh, she did buttons too. They're fun. Uh, these are all, most of them are celluloid, and clearly a black and white was a fashion, fashion trend. Bling from the 40s, 50s, and some of those are newer. I just like to put the bling together. <clears throat> These are wood, and the, the clock up here is not old. One of, a button dealer ordered those because 
when you're putting together a competition tray. I haven't talked about competition yet, have I? <laughs> Does that seem crazy? Um, just like stamp collectors, mineral collectors, those are the two I know of offhand. Huh? Paperweight collectors, they have, they may not call it a competition, but they have rules and you put together an assortment and there's even judging, A, to see if you did it right. <laughs> so that's, that's knowledge. Um, and B, just to show your um, expanse of the knowledge of that topic or that button material. When you're collecting, you're trying to find representations of all different little, little factors. You can see that in, in this one. You want animals, you want a thing, you want, oh, maybe this, this was just a fun tray. That one's not a competition tray. So that's not a very good example of, of competition. Okay, did that one. This one is leather. And there's an award for leather buttons this year at the Iowa Button Show. So I gathered all my leather buttons and put them together. These are just an assortment of buttons. Come up and take a look when we're done. Amazing. Horn. Women and deluxe shell buttons. These are not your Mississippi River, Iowa buttons, but I love them. There's a little birdie carved in this one, and there's a nest, and it's brushed with gold, filling the, the engraving lines and also some, some other colors. <clears throat> the intricacy is, is crazy. Anything else in particular right now? Yeah. Is there any like, place that you can send off a button to be like, authenticated or praised? Kind of uh, like yeah, there are button dealers that do appraisals. Um, I can give you names if, if you're interested. And button, there are button dealers and collectors that buy entire collections. Um, putting a value on a button. The factors that increase the value are, of course, age, condition, rarity, but then beyond that, complicated construction. Multiple parts, not like that, that one I showed you the slide of so much, um, but different materials put together in unusual ways, often with gemstones in them. Um, the handmade 1800s. If a button is handmade, that is an excellent button. Uh, people like Bakelite. So there's a Bakelite. This little Bakelite horse's head has a leather bridle and little brass, a little brass piece as part of the bridle. That's what I mean by a little extra embellishment to the button. That's going to push the value up also. <clears throat> they were still on the, you know, the cards from the company. You know, like we have two or four or whatever. Mm -hmm. Would that make it work more than um, There are card collectors. The buttons that card collectors like especially are... Um, the ones with cool graphics, like that very first slide. <clears throat> and, oh, there's a fun one. Here's a fun card to look for. Movie stars. The back of the card 
There's a, the front of the card has the movie star. And then there's another set of, of buttons that on the back, they have a, a child's activity. You cut it out and fold it up or something. They're fun too. Fun. Well, thank you very much for coming. Wonderful questions. Do come up and take a look. And a fun thing in button collecting is a poke box. A box or, ba or bin with buttons that you poke around, either looking for something that you're looking for or just for fun. And I've got a bunch of buttons over here. You can each pick out two or three if you'd like. Thank you. That was fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> I think we're going to be here a little while looking at everything, so I hope you have no further plans for the rest of the day. Oh, my. Until the library closes. <laughs> so, our last Iowa Files for this season will be next month. It will be on May 21st, and this subject's for me. What's up in the sky? Are we alone? <laughs> Remember the Chinese balloon that went over a while ago and we were sure it was evidence of life beyond the stars? <laughs> well, it wasn't. But there have been a lot of very interesting UFO sightings in Iowa. So we're going to have somebody here who is an expert on that to talk about it. Also want to put a push in, because Robin has needles in her hands and she'll poke at me if I don't. Um, <laughs> Robin is our main volunteer for gardening at the Jordan House and Bennett School. She would love, love, love some help this year. We have a ton of seeds. Um, we would not ask you to go out on a day like today because that would just be cruel and awful. But if anybody enjoys weeding or yeah, cleaning up, any of that stuff, um, we would hugely appreciate your help. So I want to thank our partner, the West Des Moines Public Library, the Friends Foundation of the West Des Moines Library, EMC Insurance, and our members and for making this series possible. So um, next month, uh, UFOs, and then I'm going to ask you for some advice on different programs to schedule for next year. So have a great day. <laughs>